this this webinar for future use and um, delighted to have with us today um, L. Allen Winters who is Professor of Economics and Director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory at the University of Sussex. Um, delighted to say that as the FEA we've been engaged with, with Alan in, as part of the work that we do with EURIS which is the collective of trade associations um, working to represent the, the challenges of Brexit to um, manufacturers and suppliers of, of equipment across the electrical sectors. Um, Alan has a, a very distinguished and impressive biography which includes uh, being the Chief Economist from the Department for International Development from 2008 to 2011, um, Chairman of the Board of the Global Development Network and um, Membership of the Council of the UK Economic and uh, Social Research Council and Chair of its Research Committee. Um, various senior uh, executive positions with the OECD, Commonwealth Secretariat, European Commission and the European Parliament uh, amongst others. Um, the, the key for his work with us today is um, that he's a leading specialist um, on the policy analysis of international trade, um, including that of Europe and also the, the developing companies. And uh, to accompany all of that, and not quite sure where he found the time, he published over 240 articles and 30 books. Um, so we have a, a leading expert before us today to take us through some of the policy implications of what's going on um, uh, at home as far as the uh, the Brexit issues are concerned but also on a, a wider scope in terms of the, the platform of, of trade agreements and so on. So the webinar will be about 30 minutes or so. If I can ask that you post any questions in the chat and then what I'll do is collate those together um, as we go through the, the, the meeting and uh, we can ask um, Alan to answer them at the end. So. Thank you very much for your patience. Alan, if I may hand over to you to share your screen. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you everyone for uh, coming along. I know uh, it's a busy time for everyone. Um, so uh, let me just make a few comments really. Um, you know, COVID and Brexit are both big subjects and you know, we can sort of scratch the surface. And I'm really keen to get through to the sort of questions and comments section, you know, so that I can hear you know, what you know about. Uh, uh, the situation that we're in. I'm going to share a screen with just a few slides to sort of remind me where I'm going more or less. Uh, so here we are. Uh, share. That should be it. And, uh, and there we are. So just a few thoughts really about trade in 2021. Uh, I'm going to talk about COVID a bit, I'm going to talk about Brexit a bit, and I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about COVID and Brexit, uh, the sort of killer combination. Um, uh, Keith knows, uh, those of you who don't know me uh, will soon discover, I am just professionally a pessimist. Uh, there's never a downside that I don't find myself uh, leaning towards. Uh, however, uh, there's really quite a lot to worry about. Um, and sort of first of all, I think, you know, with COVID, you know, the first of the questions is, is this just a sort of a regular uh, recession only worse? I think the important thing at the moment is, it's, it's very early to say with COVID, but we don't, you know, it, it, it seems as if it's having geographically quite different effects. Um, so it's much worse in uh, the Americas and uh, in Europe than in Asia. And um, so while it's a bit early, that I suspect is gonna remain the case. And so in a sense, the people from whom you import, the people to whom you export, actually matters a bit in thinking about how COVID's going to impinge upon you. Um, so the second observation, uh, which you know much more about uh, than I do, but that is whether we are gonna see a major change in eating habits sort of internally. Um, I, I think it's slightly unclear. Um, uh, Keith has explained to me that, you know, in a sense, your users are probably overextended anyway, so there's going to be some uh, clearing out. But I do think it's worth uh, sort of trying to explore whether, in fact, um, you know, six months and heavens, it might be nine or 12 months of lockdown, they're going to change attitudes towards um, uh, hospitality. Um, 
altogether. Now, I know there's plenty of kitchen equipment to uh, other areas like sort of education, rather residential uh, and work um, uh, environments, but uh, the eating out sector uh, does seem to me that one wants to think about. I guess, because we are not doing terribly well with uh, managing the virus, that these effects will be larger in the UK uh, than elsewhere. And that means that sort of relative to previous years, uh, maybe export markets are going to become uh, rather uh, relatively uh, more important. Um, two observations about COVID and the sort of world trading system. Uh, the first is that COVID, in a sense, has um, you know, uh, played into xenophobia and protectionism. Uh, without a doubt, the world is becoming a bit more protectionist. I don't know, well, perhaps even from uh, sort of 2010, 2011, came fairly more noticeable uh, with the election of Donald Trump. It's become even clearer. And what's happened is that we have a lot of statements, including, say, from the European Union, about making sure we produce stuff locally, shortening supply chains, and so on. In other words, the period of open world markets uh, with the, the big growth coming from exports looks as if it has some sort of, uh, well, uh, some doubts about it. Uh, the fourth thing um, is that, in a sense, COVID is going to, or perhaps even has, made government intervention respectable. Whereas if you go back to the financial crisis, it was really quite a strong effort uh, not to let governments become responsible for the whole of the economy. Uh, since then, uh, the amount of uh, trade support through subsidies has grown. But now in uh, 2020, there's a lot of talk about governments having to step in. In other words, you really are going to have to pay attention to the extent to which uh, competitors are uh, you know, receiving government support, and indeed, I suppose, uh, the extent to which uh, you are also uh, sort of uh, you know, entering into that game. Uh, so let me move on to uh, Brexit. Um, um, you all um, read the newspapers and uh, uh, listen to the news. Uh, the state of negotiation has become rather fraught uh, recently. That's it's been building up for the last uh, couple of months, really. The EU is getting very frustrated with the UK, uh, which makes it less and less likely, I think, that they are going to um, exercise themselves uh, to find compromises. My honest guess is that we still are slightly better than even's chance of getting a deal, um, but the probability of a no deal is um, significant now. Um, uh, the idea that government policy is to break international agreements is not helping, uh, as we're gonna hear for the next uh, few days. Um, second thing is that whether we get a deal or not, uh, we have already accepted uh, that the frictions on borders are going to increase. Um, uh, that's uh, the cost that the government's been prepared to pay, and uh, it is um, perfectly obvious that that is basically independent of whether or not we get a tariff-free, uh, quota-free, uh, free trade agreement with the uh, European Union. Um, it's going to involve things like standards, um, extra uh, paperwork, uh, probably logistical delays, certainly initially, and even in the longer term, I think we have to accept that borders are not going to function as smoothly as they did with Europe previously. I, my honest view is it's going to take three or four years to get round to the position that we learn how to make uh, the new system work uh, very well. Um, third, Observation is bureaucracy is bound to increase. Um, if we get a free trade agreement, you're going to have rules of origin that you need to worry about, uh, all sorts of complications about certification. And although the government has, you know, in a sense said it won't be very pedantic to start with, if we're looking sort of two or three uh, years ahead, 
we cannot, I think, expect to be in a position where the British government says de facto anything that uh, Europe does is okay with us. The whole of Brexit has been about so something different. Uh, you've seen the estimates, you may even have contributed to the estimates, uh, that the private sector will need 50,000 more form fillers. Uh, they're not in place yet, they're not trained. Um, and that is just uh, going to be a long run cost of, of subject, subjecting everything to standard uh, border formalities. I think the other thing to point out is that the, uh, uh, the bureaucracy is going to be less efficient. Um, quite a lot of process is going to be replicated in the UK and in Brussels. And it is the case that the UK is a lot smaller than Europe. It's going to make um, if there are ever, ever differences in um, standards or certification requirements, um, uh, foreign suppliers are going to prefer to put their eggs into the European basket than into the UK basket. Things will go a bit more slowly. And there are obvious economies of scale in uh, certification and negotiation of standards uh, and, and so on. Um, the UK is going to have to do it all itself for a smaller market with a smaller bureaucracy. It's going to take, I think, uh, less time, uh, going to take more time. Final thing to observe is uh, services markets are almost bound to become less competitive. I like to say the single market in services is incomplete. It is incomplete, but it's hugely much more complete than our services trade between any other sets of sovereign countries. The OECD reckons that barriers to services trade within the European economic area uh, are about a quarter of those that the um, uh, European economic area countries impose on their services trade with outside countries. Um, and all the services uh, your business services that you use are likely to become a bit slower and uh, rather more expensive, I'm afraid. Um, finally, sort of a couple of observations uh, on sort of the combination of Brexit and COVID. One is uh, you don't need me as um, manufacturers or traders to tell you about debt, but COVID is creating a mountain of debt. And debt is a discouragement for companies uh, to take risk and invest in new markets and new products and so on. So just at the time that Brexit is disrupting our traditional trading arrangements, uh, companies are going into that process in a rather weaker way. And I think that is going to uh, generate, um, well, it's going to slow things down if not actually reduce the amount of adjustment that we do uh, to the new circumstances. I think, uh, my view, I, I think it's fairly widely held, is that the UK has fairly much undermined its reputation for pragmatic and business-friendly policy. And so, you know, there's going to be increased uncertainty. I think there's going to be increased caution on the part of um, uh, business in general. And we already know that foreign direct inflows of foreign direct investment are quite a lot down even now. And I think they are going to fall further after um, uh, Brexit is implemented and uh, in, in the shadow of COVID. Um, uh, UK foreign direct investment abroad in the European Union is up. Um, finally, we have a government that is trying, it says, to introduce a really major change in the sort of balance of policy, this uh, policy of leveling up and focusing on areas outside London and the very big service oriented cities. Uh, that's a very big political challenge. And I think it's going to make it uh, more difficult for governments to really develop um, effective and coherent and consistent policy positions. So I'm afraid to say that with the sort of stresses of uh, trying to work out COVID and get over it, of accommodating Brexit, and then add on top of this a sort of quite a big change in um, uh, uh, sort of the policy objectives of the government, uh, you really do have to accept that there's going to be some policy confusion and there are going to be some uh, policy uh, mistakes. 
Uh, no, that's not very encouraging. I can't tell you what will go right and what will go wrong, I'm afraid. But frankly, you need to expect the unexpected and there are going to be some uh, nasty surprises. So those are, I don't know, a dozen bullet points that seem to me are things one needs to think about international trade 21, 22. Um, and now I'm sort of yeah, open to questions and comments. So <clears throat> just while we're waiting for some of those comments to come in, if <coughs> I may, uh, Alan, it's Keith here speaking. Um, <clears throat> The, we haven't seen a huge um, disruption to the stock markets um, and, and be interested to understand perhaps a little about what might behind that, be behind that. And also in terms of what do you feel the future might look like in terms of the, the pound against the other major currencies? Because I, I guess they are some key drivers of the, the future policy making and also the, the future future challenges that, that business and industry may face. Um, well, if I really knew how the stock market worked, I wouldn't be a professional <laughs> economist. Fessing <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, up how little I understand. Um, I, I, I think the issues over the stock market, there are at least a couple. <laughs> Uh, to bear in mind that this is the UK stock market. Um, I mean, the first is that a lot of the major firms on the stock market earn a lot of, get a lot of their earnings from abroad. And therefore they have uh, quite a lot of um, uh, cushioning uh, relative to whatever's disturbing uh, sort of production and uh, consumption in, in, in the UK. And that's relevant when I come on to the pound as well. I think the other observation is um, that we've had uh, really a very long period of easy money, uh, very easy money some of the time. Um, since uh, COVID came along, um, all the uh, statements from central banks have been very, very accommodating indeed. Um, interest rates have become vanishingly small. And in some sense, you've got to ask, well, what do I do with all this money? And particularly if you are uncertain about the way, uh, say, COVID or Brexit is going to play out, or indeed uncertain about um, government positions, um, going off from buying even property, but going off and investing in manufacturing or investing in a big distribution chain, you know, looks to be pretty risky. And so I suspect that what's going on is quite a lot of asset value is getting parked into uh, uh, the stock markets because, you know, in a sense, no one's got a better idea. Um, and ultimately, there is a feeling that you know, uh, some firms will emerge out of this uh, uh, relatively stronger. The, you know, the tech companies are already doing so, um, and there are probably other sectors as well. On the pound, um, in a sense, the, yeah, we tend to think that whatever people can foresee about the exchange rate will happen instantly. If you believe the pound is going to go down by 10% tomorrow, you would sell. So it will go down by 10% today. Um, but my own view is that um, uh, the risk of no deal and the disruption uh, from Brexit is probably underpriced in um, uh, the foreign exchange markets and my this is not the first time I sort of made this prediction and been proved wrong but my honest guess is that as the outcome of uh, the negotiations becomes clearer unless it's right at the sort of top end of what expectations might be in other words a sort of a free trade agreement and a moderately harmonious um, set of negotiations and hence an indication of future cooperation, we will see the pound take a bit of a hit um, uh, in the future. Now, the dollar happens to be very weak at the moment, so in some sense, you don't quite notice. But if one thinks about the pound uh, relative to other currencies, my guess is uh, that the promise there is uh, downward rather than upward. And that plays into what I was saying about the stock market. If the London Stock Exchange, the big companies, the FTSE 100 in particular, 
are largely earning in foreign currency and that is becoming relatively more valuable to their sterling earnings. The sterling prices of stocks in London is going to hold up well. Um, I think you get a better feel for the uh, UK economy by looking at the uh, sort of next 250 uh, companies in the stock market rather than uh, the FTSE 100. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much for that, Alan. Um, one of the questions that come in that asking, uh, what do you think the major impact will be on those of our members who are importing goods <clears throat> into the UK <clears throat> that are manufactured on uh, within Europe? Uh -huh. um, well, I think you know, there are two things. Um, I mean, it clearly does depend um, a bit on whether we get a deal. Um, but I, I don't know all of the tariff headings that affect your equipment, but I've looked at some of them. The tariffs are not terribly large, mm. and if they are certain, they're things that you can probably manage with. So I think the uh, sort of greater challenge, so far as imports are concerned, lie on possible divergence over standards. Um, it, it's a very strange, it's very difficult to call, I think, where we are at at the moment. The government is obviously incurring huge um, opprobrium from the Europeans and creating quite a lot of uncertainty in the UK so that it can diverge in principle. Uh, they periodically say, but oh, in practice we don't really intend to, but it's quite an expensive toy to get if you never intend to use it. And so I honestly think we do have to expect there will be divergence at some stage in some sectors. Whether that affects your sector, I'm afraid I just don't really have a hand. In. But if it is the case that the UK diverges um, or has a very different um, requirement so far as certification is concerned, the point I made earlier, European market is six times larger, probably going to be a bit more buoyant, um, and therefore going to the trouble of satisfying UK regulations begins to look relatively less attractive. I mean, we are still going to be quite a large economy, so it's not that people will lose interest in the British market, but it won't be um, quite as attractive. Mm. And then I suppose the third dimension is logistics. It's very, very difficult to know how the logistics are going to work out, particularly in the first few months. But I, again, you know, to re reiterate what I said, I think we're, it's going to take several years before we really work out how to make these borders more or less um, as efficient as they are at the moment. Um, the pound, I think, is going to go down, so uh, foreign prices, are, you know, price of equipment made in Europe is going to go up a bit. Um, it's, yeah, well, I mean, I think yeah, it's going to go up by amounts that are inconvenient, if not, but, but probably not catastrophic. So I think um, importing is probably going to be um, you know, still uh, perfectly viable. Margins are likely to get squeezed um, and it might be a bit more difficult to source equipment, uh, and particularly say new equipment, uh, you know, innovation. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, don't, I, I would think that importing this sort of equipment was still going to be a fairly um, viable proposition. Mm -hmm. And another question's come in. Do you see the a solution to the challenge of rules of origin, um, which is a major issue for product manufacturers? Um, and I, I guess that, in a sense, adds to the complexity of the customs administration processes that you've already alluded to. Yes, that's right. So rules of origin um, remain... Um, a bit of an enigma so far. Yeah. Um, I have spent some time looking at the uh, EU's proposed draft for the UK EU um, uh, FTA and the UK draft. The UK draft asks for a lot of accumulation whereby you can treat inputs from some other countries as if they were originating in Britain. 
for the sake of meeting the rules of origin. Um, the EU is entirely silent about this, but past um, experience with the EU suggests that they will only really give cumulation uh, to countries whose own rules of origin are very similar uh, to those that the Europeans apply. Uh, in other words, um, you know, they only want you to be able to incorporate, I don't know, um, Australian parts into the stuff that you are selling them. If those Australian parts are facing more or less the same rule of origin getting into the UK as they are as getting into the EU. Um, if we are going to exercise our sovereignty, we are going just like we are over state aid, it's going to say we won't sign up to these pan euro uh, European Mediterranean rules of origin which the EU is trying to force on us, we'll have our own. And under those circumstances, accumulation, I think, is going to be quite complicated. Um, I think it is clear that you're going to need to know quite a lot about your supply chains. Um, but for most manufactured products, um, uh, these are things that you, you don't have to unpack the whole of the supply chain because once uh, sort of an input is acquired, once an input is uh, sort of met the UK rule of origin to get into the UK uh, with a tariff um, concession, it's treated as if it is UK at that point, so you don't need to ask you know, any further back. Um, but I think it is going to be an increase in bureaucracy. It's clearly going to be an increase in paperwork. It's also the case, of course, that you have rules of origin for the free trade agreements with other countries. And this is potentially going to be an issue with Japanese, who have a slightly different view of rules of origin. And there's also in the EU-Korean free trade agreement, um, satisfying the rules of origin requires slightly different procedures. And yeah, we will now sort of you know, own all of those problems. Uh, it may, I suppose, be just about the same. But again, you know, we're looking for things to tinker with to show it's not just a rolled over agreement. So there might be changes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that answer. Um, another question that's come in is, where do you see the um, the mixed challenges of Brexit and COVID uh, impacting on governments' wish to get to net zero carbon by 2050? <laughs> um, so that's uh, uh, my uh, next research project, if I last long enough. It's one of the things we are setting ourselves up to think really hard about in the uh, UK Trade Policy Observatory. Um, I mean, as you understand, there's a very strong school of thought that says, hey, isn't this wonderful? You've decimated the economy, you're not flying anywhere else. Uh, so why don't we just freeze it here and uh, save the environment? The government's not going to do that. I mean, you, you, you have to see the way they're reacting. They want us to get back to the old normal as soon as possible. Um, so unless the government is going to just bite the bullet and say, we accept that the airlines industry is going to be 30% smaller permanently. We frankly are going back to, I think, the same sort of uh, position as we had, say, in 2019. Um, and yet we will be rather poorer. We will be rather scrabbling about to do a lot of tasks bureaucratically. And therefore, my honest anticipation is that it's going to become more difficult to persuade ourselves to um, uh, adopt the policies for climate change. I think most of the British government is fairly genuine in wanting to get there. I don't think it's quite like America where the government just doesn't buy the narrative. But the practical and political difficulties of saying, no, no, we're going to insist on this particular change for environmental reasons. And yes, 5,000 workers are going to lose their jobs, but that's the cost of doing the environment right. That's very difficult. And at the moment, you don't sort of detect a government that has got a clear enough view of what it wants to do uh, to go there. Uh, it has already de facto relaxed standards on other environmental issues like um, uh, pesticide residues and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think we 
uh, I think it's going to become more difficult. It's going to be clearly become, I think, more important. And if, as plenty pro-Europeans hope, we're going to sign a free trade agreement, everything is going to calm down, and then we might be able to get back into somewhat deeper relations with the European Union. I think it's very clear that the European Union has got a stronger um, now a political drive on climate than uh, the current British government. And so uh, any attempt to uh, sort of integrate a bit more closely with Europe, I think is going to um, lead us, leave us sort of facing climate questions and they will be quite difficult. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, any other questions for any of these? Um, uh, as we've got a really, really small group, we've just got a couple of few, a few more minutes left. Um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question of Alan, please feel free to do so. You've got a great opportunity, so uh, let's make the best use of it if we can. Well, somebody must have a burning question, I'm sure. I've depressed everybody so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, well, if there is anything, please uh, unmute yourself and, and interrupt. So, we really, I think, in, in essence, Alan, and, and perhaps just to conclude, that it's really what's going to go on regarding the, the free trade agreement, which not only is going to signal what the tariff requirement is, but you also see that as an, en an element of perhaps legacy bonding from the transition period between the UK and Europe. Yes, I think that's right. It's a, um, I mean, I think, you yeah, know, for instance, uh, you know, one worries about logistics um, from January the 1st next year. I think, you know, logistics are going to be complicated no matter where we come out. But if we get a free trade agreement reasonably harmoniously at the end, there's going to be a lot more willingness to sort of accommodate these little frictions and difficulties uh, with the logistics in the first few months of uh, 2021. Mm. If we've come out with a slanging that and, um, you know, a sort of, you know, don't def uh, let, let, let's not, you know, uh, deceive ourselves. If there is no deal, the government is going to blame it on the Europeans and they do blame pretty well, pretty strongly. Um, that is not going to make French customs officials very inclined to be forgiving about, you know, small... Mm. Uh, you know, errors in forms and so on. And I'm not at all clear that uh, British customs will be very forgiving either because that will be seen as kowtowing to the Europeans. So I think whether we get a deal or not is going to be very important for the atmosphere going forward. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Um, question that has come in, do you ever see us reapplying to, the, to join the EU? And if I had a supplementary, I guess it's if so, when? <laughs> Uh, the, the when I was going to deal with, yeah, I mean, I think I do see it as a possibility, but I don't think it's a possibility for quite a long time. Mm. And that is the reason, the reason for that really is that a lot of people have invested a lot of political capital, and they're not particularly old, in, mm. in Brexit. And to sort of to, to, to give up and say, no, no, we got it wrong, we're going to crawl back, that uh, may suit uh, sort of pointy-headed people like me, but in terms of practical politics, it's very difficult. So short of some sort of unforeseen uh, catastrophe, um, my guess is we're looking at 20 years, uh, that sort of period, before there would be any very serious political uh, mileage in, in trying to get back. Yeah. I think... Um, if there's a real economic meltdown, if there are serious geopolitical tensions elsewhere in the world, um, then I think it is possible that in some sense, uh, you know, Europe will pull together and re-entering in one form or another becomes rather natural. Mm -hmm. Because economic policy, I don't see it happening for 20 years or so. Okay, thank you. Uh, a rules of origin question again. Um, do we think this to just replicate the systems and the paperwork trail currently in place when exporting from the UK to the rest of the world, for example, to the UAE um, or to Saudi Arabia? Um, and another question, if I can just wrap a couple up together, 
Um, do we know if customs um, or warehousing duty suspense is a viable option for exporting high duty products to the EU, EU that are manufactured outside the EU in the event of a no deal situation? Okay, well, um, I think to some extent that's going to depend a little bit on the sort of atmospherics that I was talking mm -hmm. about. But I think it is perfectly possible you know, that once the dust has settled, you know, even sort of six months or so, um, uh, uh, duty-free warehousing for re-exports, you know, so um, a transit trade uh, arrangement, we ought to be able to work that out. If, um, if there are sectors for which that makes a great deal of sense, that you know, really you can only land the big ships in Southampton or something like that and you know, redistribute from there, uh, I'm sure the story should be that industry should go and make that case to government. But I would have thought that that was um, uh, something that we ought to be able to work out relatively soon. I think in terms of rules of origin, um, the paperwork requirements, I, I think, will end up being pretty similar to uh, exporting to um, a UAE or Saudi. Um, just as long um, as the substantive rule of origin is that the Europeans will be imposing on our exports are similar to you know, whatever Saudi and uh, UAE are using. Mm -hmm. I do remember, of course, that in the absence um, of uh, negotiation achieving that, uh, the Saudis, for instance, will no longer recognize French or German inputs as British origin um, in, um, when they import. So in the uh, UK-Korean uh, trade agreement that we have already, uh, they've agreed, the Koreans have agreed to treat European inputs as originating in the UK uh, for three years. But there's a commitment there'll be a renegotiation of the whole agreement. And it's very clear if there is no free trade agreement um, between the UK and the EU, the Koreans will almost certainly uh, work, you know, work back from that. So I think you know, the paperwork requirements are going to be similar, but you might have to be recording as it were, different quantities or different values, uh, you know, um, and maybe even you know, different um, third level uh, inputs and so on. Um, so I think uh, you know, if you're used to exporting to third countries now, you're quite a lot ahead of the people who've only ever exported to the European mm. Union. Um, but there will clearly be some detailed changes. Um, you, know, you, need to, you need to read the small print. Okay, good, thank you. Well, um, we don't have any other uh, questions, Alan, and I really just want to close by saying a very big thank you to you for your time this morning. I know you have a very busy diary, um, and we're grateful for the time that you've been able to set aside for us. Um, and uh, Thank you for the, your overall view, which I think is, if I take an essence out of it, there's uh, uh, some caution to be exerted, but a, a three or four year sort of settlement period and we'll, we'll know where we are at the end of it. Seems to be a, a theme that's come through on a number of different elements. Is that yeah, a fair? Yeah, I think that's probably about right. Three or four years seems a very long way away at the moment. So yes, you can is. say what you like. But <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, look, we have to make it work. You know, yeah. I mean, we cannot carry on with this degree of uh, uncertainty and chaos. And so you just got to let the dust settle. And then, you know, I trust pragmatism is going to reassert itself. Quiet, official level work, industrial sector level work is going to be able to start to solve some of the practical problems. Okay. And on that pragmatic note, we'll bring the call to an end. If I say on behalf of everybody, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thanks, Alan. All the very thank best. You. Thank you. And thank everyone for coming and the very interesting questions as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank and, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.